about the time again. And before I introduce our speaker today, I just want to make a quick announcement. So our next uh, seminar speaker will be Mark Hertz from Woods Hole. Um, so he's going to talk about noble gases from the deep earth, evidence from ocean island um, volcanoes. All right, so today we have uh, Meredith Townsend from uh, Brown University. So Meredith, it's interesting, I know Meredith from a, a workshop two, three, uh, three years ago. Uh, it's also the first work, uh, workshop when I met uh, Wunu for the first time, actually. So we met in the workshop, and then we had a lot of discussion about stress and strain. Yeah, the Gordon Conference, by the way. So we talked about stress, strain, vein, <coughs> fractures, and all of that. I mean, it was quite exciting. Um, and then uh, since some of you may know that I've been working on this um, 2018 kilowatt eruption event, and then um, I just quickly came to my mind that I should reach out to uh, Mirda. So uh, we started collaborating since um, AGU uh, um, 2018. Okay, so Mirda um, did her um, graduate from um, Stanford University for a PhD um, two, three years ago. Uh, so her um, her PhD advisor is David Poehler. He's a pretty well-known person in uh, structural geology. And it's uh, kind of a joke that my, uh, I got my PhD at UC Berkeley. And her PhD advisor was my PhD advisor's PhD advisor. <laughs> so in some way, I'm her nephew, right? <laughs> Even though I got my PhD just slightly earlier than her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, at Stanford, she was mostly working on like um, vein propagation, dye propagation, and how stress field or tectonic setting is going to influence the propagation and the condition. Um, and then she also did a PhD minor, um, I wrote it down, on um, feminist, gender, and sexuality studies. So I think she wrote a, thesis, uh, a, a report or a thesis about um, gender gender distribution in different subfields in uh, in the in the broad geosciences. Um, so, I, yeah. So that's something pretty special that she also worked on during her PhD. So since uh, so after PhD she moved to uh, Brown University. She uh, with uh, uh, working with uh, Chris uh, Huber. Mm -hmm. Huber. I don't know how Huber. Huber. And so she uh, started not working on those dye propagation, but she also worked on, you know, volcanic chamber evolution and how that grow, and then like the, the mineralogy phase change associated with the uh, magma chamber, chamber grow and the thermal condition associated with that. So it's pre pretty much the physical process of volcanology, and I think that will be partly what she's going to talk about today. And um, um, so she's still at, as a postdoc at Brown right now, but in the late summer, she's going to move to um, Eugene, Oregon, and she's going to be an assistant professor at the University of Oregon. Okay, so without further ado, let's uh, welcome Erica. Thank you. Thank you, Manghan, for inviting me here. I've, I've had a really good time. I actually got here Tuesday night, so I've been able to work with Manghan for a couple days on uh, the Kilauea eruption from last year, and that's been really exciting and, and super fun. It's been fun getting to know all of you today. Um, the first thing is a quick note that uh, I want to get through a lot of material today. Um, so I'm going to ask that if you have questions that are like general curiosity questions that um, you try to maybe write them down or remember them for the end. Um, so I'll take questions at the end. But if I completely forget to explain something really important or don't define something and you are feeling lost, then go ahead and like ask, ask, because I want everyone to stay on board um, for the whole thing. So with that, uh, the title of my presentation today is How Do Magma Chambers Grow? Insights from Thermomechanical Modeling with Applications to Large Silicic Caldera Systems. Um, and this is work that I've been doing in the last few months um, with my, is this point? Yeah, with my postdoc advisor, Chris Huber, and then um, a couple of our colleagues from uh, Cardiff University and ETH Zurich. Um, I'm going to start by actually giving kind of two introductions. Um, 
I'm obviously going to give some background and motivation for this work that I'm going to talk about in detail, but I wanted to first give sort of a broader um, introduction to the field of volcanology because not everyone thinks about volcanoes every day. And I thought it would be fun to sort of just give a little bit of an overview of, if from my perspective, some of the really big um, open questions in volcanology um, so that maybe this work has a little more context in that sense. Um, and to also just talk a little about, you know, why study magma transport and how we can study magma transport um, to give an appreciation for um, how interdisciplinary this field really is. Um, right, well, that was this slide. <laughs> so this will be my first introduction. <laughs> and then I'm gonna dive deeper into one of these open questions about how do magma chambers in the earth actually grow? And I'm gonna share with you um, some thermomechanical modeling I've been working on and uh, try to convince you that everything is really all about time scales and the comparison of the important time scales for the dominant processes going on. And then we're gonna try to compare this model to what actually happens in um, real systems around the world. So overall, um, I've worked on lots of different projects, but the main theme of my research so far has been magma transport and storage through the Earth's crust. Um, so why might you wanna study magma transport? Uh, the first thing that usually comes to people's minds is um, that maybe we'll learn something about um, how to assess volcanic hazards, right? And there's a good reason we think of volcanic hazards. You know, there are actually about 170 potentially active volcanoes in the U.S. alone. Um, and there have been about 50 eruptions in the last 30 years. And the two most infamous eruptions that come to, come to mind are um, the eruption from Kilauea volcano in Hawaii last year uh, that broke out in a subdivision and caused a lot of damage. And then the uh, eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 that actually killed over 60 people. So while we know that these two eruptions were obviously very impactful, um, we know that they actually pale in comparison to the size that eruptions can get up to. So we know the Earth is capable of so-called super eruptions, which are basically just defined as eruptions that eject over about a thousand cubic kilometers of material. So for people who don't think about eruption volumes, um, a thousand cubic kilometers of material would basically fill the entire Grand Canyon. Um, and so some of the biggest eruptions on Earth have actually come from yet another volcano in the US, Yellowstone volcano. Um, and we can see sort of the, the pattern of the eruption deposits here and just how widespread they are. Um, but these super eruptions are pretty mysterious to us actually because so far no one has ever witnessed one. Um, the most recent super eruption is from Taupo Volcano in New Zealand about 26,000 years ago that erupted about 1,170 cubic kilometers of material. So a big question on everyone's mind is, well, when is gonna be the next really big one, right? And just more generally, you know, how do we actually predict the size and frequency of volcanic eruptions on Earth? It's a really big open question. And while people tend to focus on all the bad things about volcanoes, they actually do a lot of good things for us too. Um, you know, the, the interaction of magma with fluids in the Earth's crust lead to deposition of important economically valuable minerals like gold and copper shown here, um, and that can power geothermal energy. And perhaps the most important way that uh, volcanoes have been good to us is by making our planet habitable. So basically on Earth, almost all of the crust and oceans and atmosphere um, are just material that have uh, accumulated um, from volatiles that have, and materials that have been delivered from the mantle to the surface through volcanoes. Um, and this is true not only on Earth, but on all of the terrestrial planets in the inner solar system. And one really big <clears throat> open question on that kind of planetary scale is what actually governs the partitioning of magma throughout a planet? Like what's the ratio of magma that gets erupted quickly at the surface versus stored and cooling intrusively in the crust? 
And that's really important if you want to understand things like the rate of volatile delivery through time or the rate of heat transfer through the crust. So I want to give a little background on how we study magmatic processes. Um, volcanoes are obviously a great window into magmatic processes. They're sort of the tip of the iceberg, if you will. Um, and uh, you know, geophysical techniques like um, seismic tomography and gravity surveys can help us sort of see the existence and size of bodies of magma in the subsurface. And you know, when there's volcanic unrest, we can use things like um, satellite data, like INSAR and GPS, um, and seismicity to try to understand um, the movement and migration of magma in the subsurface. Um, and it's from these kinds of observations that we've uh, <clears throat> gotten an understanding of this, what I'm going to refer to as the volcanic cycle, so which basically begins with magma being stored in some kind of a chamber in the crust. And as more magma feeds that chamber, the chamber inflates and it becomes uh, more pressurized. And eventually, if it reaches a critical pressure, then it can actually fracture the rock around it and magma will flow outward into the crust in those fractures in the form of dikes. And then those uh, dikes can propagate for a while, and if they reach the surface, then uh, they initiate eruptions. So one big question, especially at places like Hawaii, where dike intrusions are actually really frequent events, but only about half reach the surface, so a big question is, you know, what actually governs the propagation direction of dikes in the crust, and how can we predict in real time where a dike is going to go? So uh, we can also learn a lot by actually looking at the stuff that comes out of volcanoes. Um, so by, uh, for example, mapping volcanic deposits at a particular volcano, and then dating those deposits, we can get us kind of a chronology of the um, eruption uh, frequency and size at a particular volcano. And then by doing petrology and geochemistry on those um, eruptive products, we can learn a lot more about the storage conditions for the magma before it was erupted at the surface. So we can learn about the pressure and the temperature and the water content in the magma chamber that fed that eruption. And so by looking at those kinds of observations, we've sort of started to get a better understanding of what magma chambers actually look like. And we're sort of starting to refine um, our understanding of magma chambers. So for example, in this picture, you're looking at um, deposits from the eruption of Mount Mazama in Oregon that formed Crater Lake. And in some of these really big eruptions, um, it's really common to have sort of in one event two types of deposits with a, this lower unit being basically um, a sort of more highly evolved and really crystal poor uh, deposit. And then there tends to be this sharp transition to a unit that's um, relatively less evolved and very, sometimes very crystal rich, up to like 50% crystals. And so if we assume that you know, during this eruption, the chamber uh, was tapped from the top to the bottom, then we can start to build up this picture that uh, maybe the magma chamber was actually quite heterogeneous and that there was this large sort of melt-rich lens uh, resting on top of the sort of residual, what's called crystal mush. And yeah, so that raises even further questions. Like, how do these huge eruptible bodies of magma actually form? And how fast does that process happen? And also, you know, how do you actually get something that's 50% crystals to move quickly during an eruption um, and become sort of remobilized during an eruption? So another sort of complementary approach to studying magmatic processes is to look at ancient volcanoes or ancient magmatic systems where erosion has exposed the plumbing system and you can get a little bit of a different picture about what was going on. So these are just photos from two of my recent field sites. Um, on the right, studying uh, mafic dikes at Shiprock, New Mexico. And then on the left is a picture, um, here's a foot for scale, 
of a, a more silicic pluton in coastal Maine. And <clears throat> if we look at this picture from the pluton, we can start to get a little bit of a better idea about one way in which we can cause this sort of uh, melt segregation from a crystal mush. So I'm just overlaying my interpretation here where we see that there was probably some sort of resident crystal mush and then the chamber was being uh, episodically supplied by fresh gabbroic magma and then as that gabbroic magma got sort of deposited onto the chamber floor, it actually squeezed and compacted that resident crystal mush, causing the interstitial melt to kind of get squirted out and sitting and sit right on top, sometimes even breaking through to form little veins. Um, so it's from these kinds of observations that we think this sort of like magma distillation process, you know, happens perhaps not only in magma chambers that are shallow in the crust, but maybe even all the way through the entire crust, um, leaving sort of the lower crust to be uh, more mafic, and then with our sort of residual last late stage silicic stuff ending up at the top. So finally, uh, my other personal favorite method for studying magmatic processes um, is with modeling. Um, you know, modeling is useful because if we have some kind of a hypothesis about how something happens, we can actually test whether that's, you know, a physically plausible idea. Um, and we can also, you know, manipulate parameters in a way that we can't do, you know, in the field. Um, and I'm not going to belabor this point too much because <laughs> you're gonna, the rest of this is going to be about modeling. So I'm um, just going to carry on. Um, so. <clears throat> the last part of my introduction is that I want to just tell you about how I've sort of categorized some of my research projects topically in my head. Um, and I mainly am sort of thinking about them in terms of time scale. So the longer time scale things would be things like the actual construction of those long lived magma storage zones and the things that kind of happen within those reservoirs, like magmatic differentiation and the outgassing um, of volatiles in the subsurface. Whereas the short time scale processes would be things like an individual eruption event or a recharge event. And um, this also sort of, like in my head, I break this down in structural lines to the stuff that happens in like magma chambers over long periods of time versus stuff that happens in dikes or volcanic conduits. And uh, the kind of tough thing about volcanology is that a lot of the things we're really interested in, uh, they depend on both the long and short timescale processes. For example, if we're interested in what controls the ratio of magma stored in the crust versus erupted at the surface, we have to know things like, well, how long does it take for magma chambers to build and grow? But also, you know, what gets erupted depends on dikes actually surviving all the way to the surface to initiate an eruption. So, so with that, um, now that I've given you tons of interesting questions to think about, I'm not going to talk about any of those. Um, I actually want to talk about this question of how do magma chambers grow? Um, I'm going to introduce you to my favorite volcano right now and uh, some of the thermomechanical modeling that I've been using. And I'm gonna be doing this, um, you know, what you're gonna see could be applied to really any kind of volcanic system, but I've been doing this with a focus on large, shallow, silicic caldera systems. So those really kind of silicic, silicic bodies of magma up in the shallow crust. And volcanism at caldera systems tends to be bimodal. What I mean is that uh, most of the time, uh, volcanism is actually gov uh, dominated by sort of um, high frequency but small eruptive episodes. And then this behavior is punctuated by these really big caldera forming events. So, uh, personal favorite volcano of the year, Laguna de Male. Um, so Laguna de Male is a big silicic caldera system in the southern Andes. And at Laguna de Male, there have been at least two of these really big explosive caldera forming eruptions. 
one at one and a half million years ago, and another at 950,000 years ago that are up to about 80 cubic kilometers of material. And then that's in contrast with how volcanism has operated over the last 22,000 years. Um, over the last 22,000 years, there have been sort of two pulses of volcanic activity um, that have been relatively high frequency, but pretty, pretty low volumes erupted overall. But um, yeah, a lot of work has been done on this volcano, which makes it super interesting. Uh, so for example, there's been a gravity survey that shows that there's a magma body, um, a mag magma chamber most likely, that's about 30 cubic kilometers um, in volume underlying the main caldera. <clears throat> and what's really startling about this volcano is that starting in 2007 and ongoing, the, uh, the area of the lake basin has been uplifting at a really alarming rate, about 25 centimeters per year. So that's got people a little nervous about if this is going to be, um, you know, if this is the candidate for the next big one, maybe. But if we want to be able to sort of predict the, when the next big one's going to occur, and in general sort of the frequency or the, the period between these really big um, caldera forming eruptions, at a minimum we need to, you know, have a scientific understanding of what's going on underneath um, and in the magma chambers. <clears throat> so for these types of systems, we can kind of think of the magma chamber as cycling in terms of size. I just want to pause and make a note about terminology. So I'm still like learning all the jargon in this field. <clears throat> but um, in this talk today, <laughs> I'm going to refer to a magma chamber as the sort of eruptible or mobile uh, parts. So that's going to be anything just like roughly defined as less than 50% crystals. So that's the magma chamber, whereas the stuff surrounding it may <coughs> still have partial melt, but I'm going to call that the reservoir or the mush. So, so we can think about the chambers as cycling in terms of size. So somehow magma chambers have to grow to the sizes that can host those really big eruptions. And then when those really big eruptions occur, a large fraction of the chamber is erupted and the caldera forms and we're back to being smaller again and the chamber has to sort of ramp up again before being able to host the next big one. So to attack these kinds of questions, I'm just going to start by trying to understand what are the conditions that even permit magma chambers to grow, right? Just going to the most basic level of understanding. And so to do this, I'm using a thermomechanical model that was originally um, put together by Wim de Gruyter and Chris Huber in 2014. And uh, so the model starts with um, a magma chamber, a spherical magma chamber, with some initial volume, temperature, pressure, and water content. And then magma recharge basically adds uh, heat and energy uh, to the system and mass. And then heat is lost, um, conducted outward to the crust. And that causes internally um, crystallization and volatile exolution in the magma chamber. And then we also model the crust as behaving viscoelastically. And then uh, we basically calculate, we conserve mass and energy and water mass. And so we have three governing equations, which I can solve in MATLAB with an ODE solver. It's actually quite simple. And to, then we solve basically the evolution of pressure and temperature in the chamber, the volume of the chamber, and the volume fractions of the crystals melt and gas in the chamber. And so when the pressure in the chamber um, reaches some critical amount, uh, we say an eruption occurs and mass is withdrawn until the pressure returns back to the lithostatic value. And then we continue to let this run until the chamber cools to 50% um, 
crystal volume fraction, at which point we say, well, it's not so mobile anymore. So we'll end it there. Okay. So the uh, sort of the essence of the model or the behavior of magma chambers in these models can be captured with three time scales. So uh, I'm going to just walk through these time scales. They characterize sort of the three most important processes going on. So there's the injection time scale, the cooling time scale, and the viscous relaxation time scale. So the injection time scale basically just kind of describes how fast does pressure build in the magma chamber due to recharge coming in. Um, so uh, I, have a, I have a little nephew who uh, watches a lot of kids' YouTube. And there are these really silly shows. This one, I think, is called, like, Chicky. And anyway, <laughs> Chicky in this video is blowing up um, balloons of different sizes, right? And you can imagine that, like, if you had a straw or something and you're blowing, you're blowing air into these balloons uh, all at the same rate, the smaller balloons are going to be the ones that pop first, right? Um, I think <laughs> in the video, his eyes pop out. But <laughs> in any case... <laughs> But, but it's a good, it's kind of a nice principle here because this basically is saying that the injection time scale depends on like how fast you're supplying magma to the chamber, like how fast you're blowing air, but also on how big the chamber actually is, right? Okay. So the cooling time scale just describes how fast the chamber loses heat to the surroundings. And this, as it turns out, also depends on the size of the chamber. So here R is the radius of the chamber. K is thermal diffusivity. And then the third one, the viscous relaxation time scale, describes how fast the crust can deform in response to pressure changes in the chamber. So that is going to be a function of basically the, the you know, viscosity of the crust. Um, and relative to how much pressure is building. So here, this P crit is the critical overpressure required to initiate an eruption in the model. And it's also, consequently, the amount of pressure lost during an eruption to bring it back to lithostatic. OK, so now here we have a paradox. So if we were to just think about these time scales and think about what they might be, for magma chambers of different sizes. You know, if we're interested in how does a magma chamber grow from small to large, we might guess that for smaller chambers, basically all of these processes are going to be faster, right? Um, cooling is going to be faster in a smaller chamber. So smaller chambers are going to freeze quickly. The pressure is going to build more easily for the same recharge rate. So there are going to be lots of eruptions. So why would small chambers ever grow? Um, but hopefully I'll convince you that it doesn't actually matter as much what the absolute numbers are here, but rather how the timescales compare to each other. Um, so the best way that I've found to visualize, um, visualize these model results in terms of how the timescales compare is to use this regime diagram. So you're going to see this again um, over and over. So it's worth uh, paying attention for a minute here. So basically, on the x-axis, we're comparing the cooling time scale to the injection time scale. Um, and on the y-axis, we're comparing the viscous relaxation time scale to the injection time scale. <coughs> so, uh, <clears throat> for people who don't think about like time scales, but maybe they think of rates, you have to sort of flip that in your head, right? So if cooling is really fast, the time scale is really short, right? Okay. So uh, you might notice that in the regime diagrams, I've just broken it into these three regions based on basically which process wins, which is the fastest process, or which has the shortest uh, time scale. So. Uh, in region one, for example, the cooling time scale is the shortest, so cooling is the most rapid. In region two, the injection time scale is the shortest, or 
the magma recharge rate is the fastest thing that's happening. And in region three, the relaxation time scale is the shortest. Okay. <clears throat> So then in the model, we basically have these initial conditions, which we can translate to time scales, <coughs> and then uh, run the model and then calculate things that happen. Like here, we can calculate the number of eruptions that occurred over the model simulation before the model ended when uh, the chamber reached 50% crystal volume fraction. So here, each of these little dots represents a single model calculation for conditions that would place it on this regime diagram, you know, in that location. <coughs> so here the black dots represent no eruptions occurring before the chamber freezes. And the red dots represent a hundred or more eruptions occurring before the chamber freezes. So, uh, and then these two plots are for two different um, water contents in the magma. On the left, we have a slightly drier magma with three weight percent water, and on the right is a slightly wetter magma, five weight percent. So for both of these, you can see a lot of similarities. Um, most of the eruptions occur in region two. And that makes some sense because, again, that's where uh, magma recharge is the fastest process happening. So basically, you're getting tons of recharge, and that's triggering lots of eruptions. Right? And in region three, that's another one that's pretty easy to understand. Um, no eruptions occur in region three because the viscous relaxation of the crust is happening faster than anything else. So pressure never builds in the chamber because it's instantly diffused out into the crust. And in region one, that's where we start to see a difference between the dry and wet cases. So in the dry cases, we don't get any eruptions occurring in region one. But in the wet cases, we see that there are a few eruptions that occur before the chamber freezes. And these are basically um, occurring because when cooling is really fast and the magma is really wet, we actually um, we get volatile saturation and exolution to form that third fluid phase. Um, and because of the low density of that fluid phase, you can actually cause a sudden pressure increase and trigger a little eruption. Um, so we can also calculate things like what's the ratio of magma erupted versus stored. <clears throat> so here I'm plotting uh, the mass erupted to the relative to the mass added in the chamber. So this starts to help us get around to thinking about chamber growth, right? Because in order for a chamber to grow, there has to be more added than subtracted. <laughs> so here I'm basically coloring it so that red shows growth and blue shows shrinkage actually and so right away for example where the ratio is zero nothing's being erupted and that's basically again a one-to-one -one mapping with no eruptions occurring right so anything that you add to the chambers stays <laughs> stays in the chambers but what's kind of interesting is that you see this dark blue for the wet case so those eruptions that are being triggered by exolution of volatiles are actually so big that they erupt more than is added and the chamber shrinks over time. <clears throat> we can kind of just try to better understand why that is by looking at an individual model simulation. So this uh, star right here, we're gonna pull it out and just look at a time series for the change in mass of the chamber over time and the gas volume fraction over time. So we can see that at first, the, uh, these little zags are eruptions. At first, the chamber's growing, um, but then as soon as gases start dissolving, the chamber uh, moves to an overall trend uh, of shrinking over time, right? And that's because of the compressibility of the fluid phase. Um, yeah, so the fluid phase is much more compressible than the melt or the crystal phase. So during an eruption, a larger volume has to be extracted to relieve the same overpressure. And so as a result, you get these really big eruptions that actually cause the chamber to shrink. Sorry, yeah, I've had. Quick question. Uh, are you adding mass at a constant rate? 
throughout yes. these, regardless of what's happening in the chamber? Yeah, so okay. for each of these points, yeah. there's some uh, constant magma recharge rate. Okay. Um, and depending on what that rate is, so to regard to the pressure inside in the chamber, place. you add the same amount. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. So key point, uh, as it turns out from the models, at least, we see that wet systems that are cooling quickly can actually shrink over time, or basically they wouldn't really be very sustainable, because the eruptions are so big. So we can look more directly at chamber growth by just calculating the change in mass, right? So that's what I'm doing here, where again, red is going to indicate growth and blue is shrinkage. So again, we have our dry and wet case. This light blue is again that area that's shrinking. So now we can say, OK, what conditions allow magma chambers to grow, right? Well, it looks like kind of a small window of conditions, actually. We have this corner of dark red here that indicates growth. And this coincides with a region in the regime space where, oops, basically the, um, both the injection time scale and the viscous time scale are fast compared to cooling. So if cooling is really slow compared to these things, then we can get growth. Another way of saying that in plain language is that magma chambers can grow when there's lots of magma recharge into a pliable host rock, right? Um, right, so highlighting that. So key point two, growth is promoted when those two timescales win. But what's kind of cool about this area is that uh, you know, this growth, this zone of efficient growth basically overlaps this boundary. And if we come back and s remember um, about the eruption frequency uh, plot, we see that on, in some cases, you can have chamber growth and no eruptions. But in some cases, you can have chamber growth accompanied by lots of volcanic eruptions. So that's kind of a cool um, thing, like to know that chambers, you know, it's not grow or blow, it's you can get conditions where chambers are growing and having eruptions. So in order to actually now relate the modeling to real systems, you know, it, we can actually estimate these timescales at real volcanoes um, because of all those tools that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so, for example, we had that gravity survey at Laguna de Maule volcano that showed that there's a chamber that's about 30 cubic kilometers big, right? So that already helps to constrain both the cooling time scale and the injection time scale. What's also special about Laguna de Maule is that <clears throat> there's a deformed paleo shoreline that uh, basically reflects uplift um, of the volcano over the whole Holocene period. So Brad Singer and others have actually gone out and mapped that paleo shoreline and dated those um, old terraces to try to get um, out the uplift over time and then fit that to um, a Moki source, I think, <laughs> to try to understand what has been the um, addition of volume to the crust over the Holocene period. And that helps to constrain the supply rate to that system over time. Um, so, the, so between those two things, we actually have the cooling time scale and the injection time scale, both for the modern day you know, state <coughs> at Laguna de Maule, and also we can kind of um, subtract um, the amount of material added and guess how big the chamber was at the beginning of this Holocene phase. So when we do that, we get injection time scales on the order of one to 10,000 years, and cooling time scales on the order of tens to 100,000 years. Okay, so the relaxation time scale. Um, is a little bit more difficult to try to constrain from basic like volcanic observations. Um, but 
if we know roughly the depth of the magma chamber and assume you know, some kind of a reasonable geothermal gradient, we can try to constrain the viscosity of the surrounding crust um, at that location. <coughs> Excuse me. And so just in the next few things that I'm going to show, um, I'm just going to assume a crustal viscosity of 10 to the 19th Pascal seconds, which might represent something at 6 to 8 kilometers depth. Um, so when we take those time scales and plot them on the regime diagram, these two triangles are the Laguna de Maule system um, at the beginning and end of that Holocene volcanic phase. And uh, there are a lot of cool things to point out here. The most obvious thing is that the triangles fall in that zone of growth. Um, and on the side, that's predicted to have lots of volcanic eruptions. And that's cool because that's what we see in the Holocene phase, where we know there have been lots of volcanic eruptions, and there's been significant addition of material to the crust. The other thing to kind of see here um, is that these two points kind of give you a sense for um, how these timescales evolve over time as the, this chamber is growing. <clears throat> so just for reference, <clears throat> these two uh, arrows here represent how much different the timescales would be, or basically where you would plot on this regime diagram if the volume of the chamber was greater by an order of magnitude, or if the volume of the, ch or if, sorry, if the mass recharge rate um, was greater by an order of magnitude. Um, so it's, I guess, kind of order of magnitude error bars, if you will. Um, so we see that L1 shifts down into the left to L2. So that's sort of mirroring this uh, trajectory of increasing volume, right? So it's basically showing how the chamber is growing over time and evolving. We can repeat this exercise for other volcanic systems in the world. So I did this for Aso Volcano in Japan, Campi Flegrei in Italy, and Santorini Volcano in Greece. And I was kind of surprised how well this worked, I guess. But uh, <coughs> they all seem to plot like pretty close to this zone of growth and simultaneous eruption. And so from this, I've sort of concluded that perhaps those, um, those episodes of volcanic activity that occur between the really big caldera forming eruptions probably reflect um, growth of the underlying system. <coughs> so basically periods of time where the magma recharge rate is both um, supplying new magma and growing the system and also triggering a few eruptions. So finally, we can also um, calculate growth rates from the model. Um, this is just uh, volumetric growth rates in cubic kilometers per year, <clears throat> with the yellow being the higher um, growth rates. <coughs> and we see that, you know, these systems, which tend to evolve as they grow down into the left in this regime space, start to sort of climb up those contours of growth rate. So in other words, as chambers grow, the growth rate actually speeds up. So we would actually expect growth to be fairly nonlinear in time and maybe take off after a certain kind of critical size. Well, so if, if chambers are growing and that's causing the time scales to evolve, then it's reasonable to think that other things that depend on those time scales are also going to change. Right, so if the injection and cooling and relaxation timescales control the behavior of the system and those are changing, how does that affect eruption frequency over time and the size of eruptions over time? Is there a relationship? And if so, is there some way to use the frequency and size distribution of these volcanic phases to infer how much the chamber um, is growing and how fast and where it is in its caldera cycle? <clears throat> so now I'm just throwing it all at you. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
<clears throat> All right. I want to spend some time on this because it looks like a lot, but it's really important. So I used the model to try to understand um, scaling relationships for things like eruption frequency and size as a function of like parameters we can estimate. So the eruption frequency, for example, you might guess, you know, what should it depend on? Well, probably the magma supply rate, probably the size of the chamber. And indeed, uh, I used the model results to basically um, find scaling, those scaling relationships. Um, and by finding that, okay, here's where they all collapse on that nice line, I found the relationship. So from the model results, I found that eruption frequency scales proportionally with the magma recharge rate and inversely proportional with the magma chamber volume and compressibility, right? And then I did the same for the eruption volume and found that the volume of an individual volcanic eruption is proportional to the volume of the chamber and the compressibility of the chamber, right? So that's cool. And what's more is that our volcanic systems, since we can estimate those parameters, and we have that eruptive history from all the deposits and all the hard work that people have done to date those deposits and map them, we can place them on here and we find that they actually fall pretty close to the line. Um, so it's sort of a nice check that, wow, maybe we can use eruption frequency and size to get back at these parameters that we don't maybe know as well without doing huge geophysical surveys and whatnot. Um, and what's cool is that, you know, if we're expecting that a chamber is going to be growing over time, then we can anticipate that the eruption frequency should drop, but the size of the eruption should increase over time. And that is actually what we see for Laguna de Male in the last 22,000 years. That first pulse um, was had an eruption frequency of about twice that of the next pulse, but that next pulse was much higher in volume. And so that's the L1 to L2 that we're, so we're seeing that drop in frequency and increase in eruption size as the chamber is growing. Different colors the oh, right. Um, the different colors are indicating <clears throat> the phases present. So if it's, if it's exolved, if it has a, an exolved fluid phase or not. Um, so for example, here, if we were to get rid of compressibility in the scaling relationship, these three lines would, or they would separate between the ones that contain an exolved phase and the ones that are not yet saturated and only have melt and crystals. So by taking compressibility into account, we get them to fall onto the line. <clears throat> All right, so just to recap the main points. Um, so I showed you how we can use thermomechanical modeling to understand chamber growth. <clears throat> and we found that growth is basically encouraged if it, when injection to the chamber is rapid and the chamber is hosted within a pretty pliable crust. And we found that if the chambers are too small or too wet, basically if cooling is really fast, then they're not going to be so sustainable. They can even shrink over time, even when constantly recharged. <clears throat> we also found that chambers can simultaneously grow and erupt. And we uh, estimated the time scales at these different volcanoes and found this to be the case for those volcanic episodes. We also found that as chambers grow, their time scales evolve towards a region that favors further growth. And that also, that's going to be expected to correlate with a drop in eruption frequency, but an increase in the size of eruptions. Right. So at, at this point, um, I'm done. <laughs> but I just want to share a couple of um, new things that we're sort of working on um, as this project evolves. One question that you might be wondering is, well, <laughs> why do all the systems that you looked at cluster here? Are you only looking at systems that cluster there? You know, can you find systems that are somewhere else in regime space? And I think 
that actually the answer is no. I don't think you would see those things, right? So if there's a magma chamber that plots here in the regime space, well, it's going to die pretty quickly. It's, gonna, it's not going to be sustainable for a long period of time. And maybe you get things that plot here. Maybe there's lots of magma getting stored underground, um, but it's not contributing to the volcanic record, so we don't see it, right? So things that are long-lived that have volcanic output kind of by definition should be here, right? So, that's, so we can kind of say like, okay, well, you know, at what depth in the crust are these conditions met, right? So another thing that we're working on is um, trying to understand the depth of volcanically active reservoirs in the crust. You know, we have all these geophysical observations and um, geochemical observations from erupted products that magma chambers in the Earth's crust tend to grow and be at about two kilobar. And that's pretty consistent across the Earth. And so we've actually found that two kilobar is sort of the sweet spot that allows the simultaneous growth and eruption of volcanoes. If you're too shallow in the crust, then fluids can exolve really quickly and easily. And so any chambers that form too shallow are not going to be sustainable. Chambers that form too deep are going to be hosted in much warmer crust that can easily diffuse pressure. And so you may grow lots of chambers here, but they're not going to contribute to the volcanic record. So we're calling that the plutonic roots. Um, you may also be wondering, what is this fluid phase? So right now, we're just assuming it's pure water. But we know that that's not the only volatile species in magmas. And we know that sort of chemical cocktails have different solubilities. Um, so we've got a really bright student at Brown working on adding CO2 to the <coughs> volatile phase to try to understand how that affects the solubility and the, the melting curve. And does that actually affect where chambers grow and how they, how they grow? Um, and then another thing I'm working on that's actually part of my project with Monghan is to try to say, all right, well, you know, in this model, we don't really deal with eruptions. Like, we're not dealing with the eruptive process. We're saying, okay, the chamber is out of critical pressure. There's an eruption. Mass is gone now. But we actually know that in order for an eruption to occur, a dike has to actually thermally and mechanically survive all the way to the surface, which is much uh, easier said than done, I guess. And so one thing I'm working on is trying to um, add in a coupled dike chamber model to actually capture those dynamics to try to understand, uh, you know, when actually can you get eruptions? Um, so I'll end with there and finally take questions. You mean you don't want to stare at this mess uh, in right here? So you just talked about dike formation and predicting, basically predicting an eruption. So on your plot, you had trends of volcanoes. And at the beginning of the talk, you had uh, teased us with these super volcanoes. So I would think that maybe if you had more information, you could predict when a super volcano would occur. So for example, if you have information for Yellowstone's eruptions, you have information of where it's going to plot in your XY diagram, you could then say, well, it looks like in 15,000 years it's going to erupt. Yeah. Yeah, you could. Okay. I, I get a little shy about making predictions. But, um, I mean, the other thing to note is that I would say this model is awesome if you want to understand basic processes and if you want to understand the long-term evolution of the magma chamber. There are a lot of things that, um, there are a lot of details that if you really wanted to nail down one specific eruption and understand that, that you would have to add on or, or correct for to really understand short, short time scale things, like, the, like adding a dike, for example, right? Um, so I would say that I would be a little wary to use it for like actual forecasting with a certain error. So the study that you showed that you have this rose of the chamber and the eruptions get 
more infrequent and larger. You can see how that can get to a very large eruption eventually. In the record you showed from Lagrange and Maori, you started with these big eruptions and then you went to the very small ones. So how did you, how do you think the system essentially went backward and went from after the last mm. 950,000 years ago eruption to the sequence of small ones you see in there? Yeah. So, so again, um, you know, we're not modeling here the actual eruptive processes. Presumably, those really big eruptions do occur, and things get out of control, and you know, are not captured in the model. But when those really big, explosive volcano uh, caldera forming eruptions occur, I think they probably empty out a pretty significant portion of the magma chamber. So now you're back to having something small, and that small thing is going to. Um, have frequent small volume eruptions until it can build back up again. Sort of the conceptual model. Would the caldera formation count as shrinkage or not? Um, Would that, so because like on your diagram all your eruptions kind of how people think about calderas forming. Like one way to think of it is that you have so much evacuation of the magma chamber that now you can no longer support the overlying crust and it falls. Um, we saw that at Kilauea last year. Yeah, so I have a question about uh, crustal rheology. So, um, so I, this, is, this is what's controlling the, the uh, viscous react relaxation time, correct? Right, So yeah. I would imagine as you're growing, you know, as you're growing a magma chamber and you're injecting heat into the crustal column, the material properties of the crust are going to evolve as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if your if your thermomechanical models take that potential nonlinearity into account. Yeah, they do actually. Um, I didn't spend much time talking about that, but yeah. So there's there's a we solve for spherical heat conduction into the crust, and then we solve the effective yeah. viscosity. We actually solve viscosity um, as a function of distance from the chamber, as a function of temperature. So as the system grows and evolves um, and the temperature changes around the crust, so does the viscosity. Um, so you could use the model to look at that and see how the viscosity changes over time too, if you wanted. So going off of that, like, well, to what degree um, can the magma chamber interact with the surrounding material? Do you have that mush layer in there? Like, to what degree can it dissolve things or can you train mm -hmm. surrounding partial magma Yeah. Um, Right now, there's no, um, other than the magma recharge rate in and the mass withdrawal during eruptions, there's no exchange of mass. So actually, somebody is working on that, though. Um, someone in our group, um, who I don't know very well right now, um, is actually adding uh, plutonic outgassing. So assuming that mush surrounding the chamber is permeable, and that the pressure is building in the magma chamber, then the volatile phase will be at higher pressure than the surroundings and actually get, you know, permeate out into the, the chamber. So someone is actually adding that to the model as we speak. In these, that's not going on. Um, mm -hmm. Let's take three more. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think your work does have great implications in the field of uh, ore deposits. Mm. Um, especially, of course, ore deposits that are associated with high temperature magmatic hydrothermal systems. And uh, there, if you talk to economic geologists, especially mineral uh, explorationists, over the years who have a lot of experience in volcano plutonic complexes, uh, many times they'll tell you, well, during a certain period of uh, plutonic volcanic evolution, you didn't get any mineral deposits, and in part it's because of what they call, they would usually use the term, they say the system vented. Huh. And uh, that probably <coughs> corresponds to your case where a very large proportion of the magma chamber is lost, including all of the volatiles that may contain metals actually go up in the eruption, which again is an ash, a, a tough, mm -hmm. instead of an order pile. Um, the other thing is that many times we find that the uh, magmatic systems, when we look at them in an eroded state that are associated with ore deposits, we'll find that um, there's a cupola associated with a larger underlying magma chamber. And what, of course, that does is it gives you a little bit of a spectrum 
in terms of the behavior of the wall rocks in your model. And we can see that uh, sometimes it's a small, shallow uh, region of a plutonic system that's associated with mineralization, whereas the deeper parts are not, hmm. possibly due to this uh, spectrum of behaviors that, that you're talking about. Also, the last thing I'll say is that um, many times we see these magmatic hydrothermal ore deposits produced during the decay and death of the uh, magmatic system. And we can tell because later stages of hydrothermal activity actually invade the uh, upper portions, now crystallized portions mm -hmm. of the magmatic system. So you can see uh, some of, as I'm watching your presentation, I can, I'm imagining some of the things that I've seen in the field over the mm -hmm. last few decades about um, uh, how these systems actually die. Now they can be erupting, as you pointed out, and you, because you see dikes, and you'll see what are called intermineral dikes. So you'll see veining and diking, and they're crisscrossing each other, and the system is dying <coughs> as that happens. So I think I think your work is uh, uh, very valuable in terms of understanding those systems. Oh, well, well, thanks. One kind of comment that came to mind yeah. um, in response is that. Um, People who work on the petrology of these systems over time see that uh, throughout the caldera cycle, a progression towards wetter, more evolved magmas over time. And then after the uh, huge caldera collapse, it goes back to being like hot, dry, more mafic. Yes. Anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Well, I think probably we can <laughs> our questions and move out to the geological Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>